Actually, the FDA doesn't know what healthy is. The USDA doesn't even have a definition for healthy. Um, you know, everyone comes up with their own definition. And the question is, what makes sense? And, you know, the fact that we Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Edge. My name is Dr. Marcus Rennie. I'm your champion of well-being, and I'm super excited today for this guest that we have uh, this afternoon. He is the Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at UCSF. It is uh, Professor Robert Lustig. Uh, I'll give you a bit of a background as to his incredible work over the last 40 years in this space. Uh, he's the author of many books, a lot of which you would have all read, but of course the one we're going to be talking about specifically today is his latest work called Metabolical. And uh, he's authored 85 peer-reviewed papers, uh, many, many more fellowships, uh, and most recently started the RHL Foundation, which stands for the Robert H. Lustig Foundation, which focuses on three aspects of education and health, applied research, education programming, and clinical research fellowships as well. We're going to go into some deep dive into the role of food in our lives, how it affects our health and our performance. And for all of the young parents like myself out there, we're going to talk about the importance of making sure that our kids are eating healthily so that they lead long, happy, healthy lives as well. Professor Robert, welcome to The Edge. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Rani. It's my pleasure. And uh, tell us, where are you and uh, where in the world are you? Because I love asking that question now. <laughs> Well, from from my environs here, you can tell I'm in my office, uh, in my in my home. Uh, haven't ventured out very much, although this past weekend, you know, was the first uh, uh, weekend that Americans uh, made it outside without masks. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, the future. Absolutely, we all are very much so. So, let food be thy medicine, let medicine be thy food. I wonder if Hippocrates were alive today, how he may change that. Yes, I think Hippocrates, um, he, he was right for his time, but he is wrong for our time. Uh, I think what we need to do is we need to do a quick update because he believed in the role of food as medicine. And I actually think that that's part of what's gotten us into this mess. Um, what I would argue is that if he were alive today, you know, he would recognize that McDonald's is not medicine. Um, and so he would have to rephrase good food is me medicine, bad food needs medicine. And in fact, uh, what we've learned over the last, I would say, 10 years is that food can e either be medicine or poison. And when I say poison, I'm very specific. I mean, it sounds like hyperbole, but actually not. Um, if you uh, cause dysfunction of specific subcellular pathways, mitochondrial uh, enzymes, um, you're, you're a poison. And, you know, you're not a whole lot different, actually, than slow cyanide, because that's exactly what um, cyanide does in mitochondria. And so we now have the data to demonstrate that certain components of our food, particularly what is found in ultra processed food, actually causes cell damage. And that's what I go through in the book, Metabolical, is you know, explaining the difference between food and processed food, which actually shouldn't be called food at all. All right. So let's uh, let's go down this journey of, of of eating, and I suppose it begins with the, uh, the the hunger reflex. We all feel hungry during the day, and to do that, we sated ourselves with food. But what is the biochemical basis of hunger? What are the hormones involved, and in, and why does our body trigger this as a response, emotional response? Well, there there are two paths. Ways. There's what I would call the um, immediate pathway and the long-term pathway, and they're, and they're slightly different, and they involve different hormonal signals. The immediate pathway, the meal-to-meal -meal pathway, if you will, are alimentary hormones, and the two that really comprise the uh, acute pathway, the meal-to-meal -meal pathway, are ghrelin and peptide YY3-36. Ghrelin is a hormone made in the stomach. When your stomach is empty, ghrelin levels go up. They circulate in the bloodstream, go to your brain, and they tell your brain, I'm hungry, feed me. And so you eat. 
And then so ghrelin levels go down. Now, is that the end of hunger? Yes. Is that the end of the meal? No. And the reason is because the end of hunger is not satiety. Those are two separate phenomena. Satiety occurs much later. <clears throat> and satiety occurs due to a second hormone that is found in the distal intestine called peptide YY3 to 36. The food has to make it all the way down to the ileum, the third part of the intestine, before those cells called L cells get triggered, release peptide YY into the circulation. That goes to the brain. And then the brain says, I am stuffed. I couldn't eat another bite. I will die before I eat again. Okay. Two different things, end of hunger and satiety, not the same. And the fact of the matter is that's part of the reason we have a problem is because we all eat past the end of hunger, particularly when there's palatable food on the plate. And that's called dessert, if you, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, <clears throat> so that's the acute or the meal to meal uh, effect. Then the second one is the long term one, the measure of adiposity, so that your brain knows how many, much fat is sort of circulating, you know, it's sitting on your bones, whether or not you have enough energy on board to engage in expensive metabolic processes, whether you can burn energy properly, kind of like your thermostat in your house. It's a servo mechanism. And that those two hormones that control that are leptin and insulin. Now, leptin is a hormone that was discovered in 1994. It goes from your fat cell to your brain and tells your brain, I'm relatively, shall we say, replete with energy. I'm not starving. So with for leptin, there's the floor, but no ceiling there. It basically, you, your brain can see leptin deficiency. It can't see leptin excess. So when your brain can't see leptin, it says, I'm starving. I need more energy to make more fat, to make more leptin. And so you eat and you continue to eat. The other hormone that's important is insulin. Now, insulin in the acute phase, when it's released in response to a meal, says, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing the meal. I don't need any more. And so it's part of the satiety signal. On the other hand, when insulin levels are high, insulin is stealing energy away from the bloodstream and putting it into the fat cell for storage. It's basically telling the brain, hey, I need more. And what we've learned is that insulin is sort of the linchpin in this story because it's telling the fat cell store, but it's telling the brain stop, except in the chronic state where it's telling the fat cell store and it's telling the brain keep going. And it is this dichotomy of insulin's action that is at the, uh, at the uh, uh, basis of what's going wrong with obesity. What we've learned, the piece of the nugget of truth is that insulin blocks leptin. Insulin blocks leptin signaling. So when your insulin's high, your brain can't see its leptin. Now you say to yourself, well, why would that be? Yes, are, they, are you suggesting that competitor antagonists had a, had a similar receptor? Or? It's, so it, what it is, is it's at a post-translational modification of the leptin receptor. In fact, it's at SOX3 also at SHB2, these are specific uh, molecules that are involved in leptin signal transduction. And they basically cause the leptin receptor not to work right. Mm -hmm. So insulin blocks leptin signaling. So you would say like, why would God do that to us? What's, what's the selective advantage? And the answer is because if leptin worked right all the time, you could never gain weight. And there are two times in your life you actually do have to gain weight. They're called puberty and pregnancy. No weight gain during puberty or pregnancy. Guess what? Species dies out. Yeah. So if your leptin worked right 24, 7, 365, you could never gain the weight because the servo mechanism, like the thermostat in your house, would never let it get too hot or too cold. And so you'd always stay the same. And you'd never gain the weight. Well, during puberty and pregnancy, that system has to be interfered with. Now, doesn't it make sense that the hormone that causes the weight gain should also be the hormone that blocks the leptin at the level of the brain so that the whole thing is yoked together? So insulin blocks leptin, and it's only supposed to do it twice in your life, puberty and pregnancy. But now 
we're hyperinsulinemic all the time. And the question, of course, is why is that? And that's what I've been investigating for the last 25 years. Yeah. So let's get to that, because it's interesting that uh, Professor Pediatrics is looking at this aspect to do with food, uh, sugars, and uh, what would be really nice uh, is to sort of connect the dots for us. Now, I've, I've, I've heard you speak about the early studies that you were doing with uh, hyper, hypothalamic pituitary disease in young children, and that sort of leading to this whole cascade, which has brought you to where you are today as a public health uh, advocate. But, but walk us through that journey and, and how that happened. So um, in 1995, I moved to Memphis, Tennessee to be an uh, endocrinologist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is you know pediatric cancer hospital. And we had a lot of patients who had survived their brain tumors, but fully 75% of them became massively obese after the treatment. They were perfectly normal weight before the treatment, but became massively obese after the treatment. And the parents were saying, this is double jeopardy. My kids survived the tumor only to succumb to the therapy. And it was, you know, behooved me to try to figure out what to do for them. <clears throat> now, this is a well-known phenomenon in medicine. It's been known since 1901. It was described originally by Babinski and Freelich. It's called hypothalamic obesity, a damage to this area of the brain at the base of the brain called the hypothalamus, which controls hormonal secretions of the body. When you damage it, you become massively obese afterwards. And there's an animal model for it, et cetera. And this, this was well known. But what wasn't known is why. Why does this happen? Um, I did a lot of lit researching at that point because I had, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 kids like this, you know, sitting in my clinic and I had to do something for them. And what I looked at the animal literature and it looked like that if the, one of the reasons why these animals gained weight was because their insulin levels went sky high. Okay, that this insulin was driving everything they ate straight into fat before they ever had a chance to burn it. They were storing it. They were basically energy storage machines because their pancreases were over-releasing insulin. So I said back in 1995, what if we gave these kids a medicine, a drug that could block insulin release? And there was one you know, available to us called octreotide. Oh, yeah. right. It's normally, it's normally used to prevent growth hormone from being released, but it also prevents insulin from being released. So we used it for that. And I did it in a pilot fashion on eight patients. And lo and behold, patients started losing weight. But even more importantly, the patients started exercising spontaneously. These were kids who sat on the couch, ate Doritos and slept. And now all of a sudden they're active and the parents are saying, I've got my kid back. And the kids are saying, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the clouds since the tumor. One kid became a competitive swimmer. Two kids started lifting weights at home. One kid became the manager of his high school basketball team, running around, collecting all the basketballs. I mean, you know, these were kids who were lumps on a log who did nothing. And now all of a sudden they got their lives back. And I didn't tell them to get their lives back. They just got their lives back. So this was really, really important, you know? And what it said was that the behavior might be actually subservient to a biochemical mechanism. So we did a, um, a study, a, a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to follow this one up, where we built a quality of life questionnaire in. And what we found out was that as we got the insulin down, these patients' quality of life and exercise capacity and activity increased commensurately. So this was proof, not theory, not correlation. This was causation because we basically interfered with insulin release and we got both weight loss, reduction in appetite and increase in spontaneous activity. This is causation. And what it told me was that the biochemistry drives the behavior. And up to that point, that was a completely new, novel concept. Up to that point, it was always the patient's fault. Right. And this was the first glimmer that maybe the patient has nothing to do with it. It's very interesting. And I think, you know, for people watching, 
who are not from a medical background, they would have heard about insulin through the, the lens of diabetes, right? So reminding our viewers that we eat food, that food is then sort of masticated in the mouth, it makes its way into the stomach, it begins its early digestion through the effects of stomach acid, um, amylase and other types of enzymes. And then as it enters that first part of the, the duodenum, it then causes this signal and then the pancreas, the beta cells that people have heard of, that then secretes the insulin. Now, in the role of diabetes, uh, insulin's effect is principally, I, I understand, the GLUT4 transporter where you're then trying to move the glucose from the bloodstream either into the liver or into the muscles for storage. So it, for, for the liver, it's the glute two. Glute two, uh, and then glute four. And, the... and, for mu and for muscles, actually for adipose tissue, it's glute four. Okay. Different, different tissues have different glucose transporters. Okay. The brain has glute one, you know, so the, it's, it's, it, it's very specific to the, to, to the tissue. Right. But the other part of insulin now is the activation of MAP kinase and insulin really acting as a trophic factor, i.e. stimulating... Right growth, putting that, that fuel away as storage, and then a whole series of other growth mechanisms in different parts of the body that leads to different consequences. So, so help, help us understand that aspect. Where do we see growth and, and how dangerous can it really be? Right. I, I, this, is, this is sort of the key to the kingdom. And it's the reason why insulin is the linchpin mm -hmm. in all of this in terms of chronic disease. So every cell in your body has to grow and has to burn, but never at the same time. They either grow or they burn, but never both. And the question is, how does it do that? And how does it know when? Yeah. Okay, this is sort of the ultimate, you know, sort of the holy grail of cell biology. Well, turns out. There are sp three specific enzymes in cells that tell it whether to grow or burn and live or die. And these three enzymes, and they're all kinases, one is called PI3 kinase, and it's the kinase that Lou Cantley showed is associated with cancer. The second one is AMP kinase, adenosine monophosphate kinase, and it's associated with mitochondrial function. It's where metformin works. Yeah. And the third one is called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. And that has now been shown to have very specific, both cardiovascular and immune functions. And we're still trying to get our handle around how, how to you know, take advantage of that. But these are the three enzymes. And it turns out that insulin drives energy into cells, but it also drives the growth apparatus. So it's driving increased glucose uptake, but it's driving growth. It's not driving burning. It's driving storage. And when those three enzymes are working in concert with each other in one direction, you get growth. When those three enzymes are working in concert in the opposite direction, you're getting burning. But when those three enzymes are disynchronous and not working, and they're working at cross purposes, they're not all lined up. That's when you get chronic disease. And insulin is one of the things that makes that, that flips that, particularly in terms of the AMP kinase. So we now know that insulin is a bad guy because yes, it has metabolic effects. That's why type one diabetics have to take insulin. And if they don't take insulin, they will die because of its metabolic effects, its glucose lowering effects, its fat storing effects, all of which are necessary for life, but it also has this second function, this growth function, as you called it, this trophic function. And that occurs through a completely different set of pathways in the cell. The metabolic function is mediated through something called AKT. The, set, the uh, growth function is mediated through this other uh, enzyme called MAP kinase. And the bottom line is it is that growth function that leads to chronic disease. It causes coronary artery muscle proliferation. It causes renal, artery, um, renal uh, glomerular sclerosis. It causes cancer because it's causing cell division, po possibly at a time when you don't want it. So you want it when you're a fetus, 
That's when you have the fastest growth. But after that, you want to slow your growth down. The higher your insulin, the greater the growth, and that causes problems. And this is all laid out in the new book. And basically how our diet ultimately impacts on these three enzymes and on insulin to lead to chronic disease. Yeah, this is a very important point. Viewers who are watching this, especially those of you who may be diabetic or pre-diabetic, and you go in to see your doctor, and this happens to me all the time where they, they, you know, they come in and they glycosylated hemoglobin, the HbA1c, would be normal. And then a lot of colleagues would just say to them, oh, you've got nothing to worry about. You can, you know, you're not at risk. You can you know, come back and see me in, in, in three years, et cetera. Whereas the real test that we should be doing as practitioners is to actually test their insulin levels. Because if that's the one that's telling us the full story, right? And it's the lower, the better, not that you suddenly have this high insulin. So uh, this is a very important point. The um, American Diabetes Association, very specifically, right on their website, says, do not test for fasting insulin, that that is a mistake. And for God knows what reason, you know, doctors believe that. I, I am here to try to undo the damage that the American Diabetes Association is doing. Now, why is it that they say that? Well, they say it for two reasons, both of which are actually um, uh, uh, false. And I'll explain why. The first reason they say it is because insulin assays around the world are not standardized. That's true. I don't argue that. The reason they're not standardized is because most of them use either a radio amino assay or an ELISA, you know, some, some form of recognizing the insulin molecule. Now, there's another molecule that is released when the beta cell has to work very hard hard. And it's called pro-insulin. And pro-insulin looks a whole lot like insulin and, and so binds to those same the antibodies. The peptide that breaks off, right? That's correct. So right. when pro-insulin when pro -insulin is made in the pancreas, an enzyme called prohormone convertase 1 cleaves a piece of that out, and that one's called C-peptide. And now you have the mature insulin molecule, which is what's supposed to get released. But when your beta cell is working overtime, when it's you know running on fumes, when it's huffing and puffing, it's just trying to get everything out of the cell as fast as it can, You know, just trying to dump what it can. And so pro-insulin is released as well. And pro-insulin only has 5% of the efficacy at blood sugar reduction as does insulin, but it gets picked up in the insulin assay. So sometimes you will see a very high insulin level and it's probably not insulin, it's probably pro-insulin. So the American Diabetes Association says, well then don't draw it because you, it can be fist, you know, uh, uh, fist, you know, um, fallaciously high. Yeah. I say, if it's high, that's telling you there's a problem and you need to know that. Yeah. Okay. You know, if, if, if it wasn't high, that would be a different issue, but it's high, if it's high, you need to know that. So a false positive is still a positive in this case. So that's the first reason I think there's a problem with the ADA, their, their determination on this. The second reason the ADA says don't draw fasting insulin is because fasting insulin levels do not correlate with obesity. That is true. I don't argue that. It correlates with metabolic health. So obesity is only the fat you can see, the big butt fat, if you will. The, the you know, does this swimsuit make me look fat? You know, um, uh, that's for male and female, by the way. Um, that fat. And it's true that fasting insulin does not correlate with that fat. What it correlates with is the visceral and liver fat, which is the much more egregious metabolic fat because that's telling you whether or not the liver is healthy and whether the uh, visceral fat is um, uh, working properly as well. So it's not the, the, the fat you can see is not the dangerous fat. It's the cosmetically undesirable fat, but it's not the dangerous fat from a medical standpoint. And in fact, fasting insulin correlates with the visceral and the liver fat quite nicely. So for both reasons, I think the ADA has to rethink what they are telling people. And I think that fasting insulin is the first test 
that people should have drawn. And, but their doctor know, needs to know how to interpret it. And since they've never done it before, they're going to balk. And that's why I wrote the book is yeah. so that people can be armed with this information. So they could go to their doctor and say, this is what I want. And here's why I want. Yeah. So if, if it is an early signal of sick metabolic disease, you know, sick metabolic yeah. health down the line, assuming a normal HbA1c comes up for an individual, how many years before that change in glycosylated hemoglobin occurs, would you begin to see this rise in the background insulin levels? So you can see the rise in the background insulin levels very early, even before any change in hemoglobin A1c. So, and we know that because, you know, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I would see patients all the time who would come in and their hemoglobin A1c was still below 5.5%, perfectly normal, but their fasting insulin would be quite high. And then I would check their urine and they would have microalbuminuria. They would already have the kidney leak of albumin into the urine, which is what happens due to insulin. So. People think that the kidney disease of diabetes is due to the high glucose. That is not the case, not the case. And this is again, one of these Eureka moments. It is a mouse and I love this mouse. This is my favorite mouse in all of medicine. Okay. It is the mouse that basically has to send all doctors back to medical school. It is called the Paderco mouse, P-O-D-I-R-K-O. And it's the glomerular podocyte insulin receptor knockout mouse uh, that Ron Kahn's lab developed back at, at Joslin Diabetes uh, uh, Institute back in 2008. And what they did was they took the insulin receptor out of the kidney, left it everywhere else, perfectly normal, just no insulin receptor in the kidney. Cannot, kidney cannot respond to insulin. That's it. This animal has completely normal blood sugars, completely euglycemic, no diabetes, no insulin resistance as far as the body can be measured. But this animal has the worst diabetic nephropathy, the worst diabetic kidney disease of any animal model on the planet. So how do you get diabetic kidney disease without diabetes? And the answer is because it's not about the glucose. It's about the insulin. When your kidney becomes insulin resistant, that's when it starts getting sick. Not because of the high glucose, but because of the insulin resistance. So this is a paradigm shift. This is one of those eureka moments in medicine when we should really, you know, sit up and take notice about what we are doing and what we are promulgating. We can't just get the glucose down as doctors. We have to get the insulin down too. And it is only the people who have both the glucose and the insulin down together that are metabolically healthy. And we are not doing that. Let's talk about that. In your book, you you have this wonderful phrase saying the principle of protecting the liver and feeding the gut. Uh, And we'll we'll get to feeding the gut later on. Uh, But let's just focus on the liver, this this big organ, which is so important for health and well-being. What did you mean by that statement, eat to protect the liver? So people don't know what healthy is. Actually, the FDA doesn't know what healthy is. The USDA doesn't even have a definition for healthy. Um, You know, everyone comes up with their own definition. And the question is, what makes sense? And, you know, the fact that we don't have a definition for healthy, let's food industry concerns put healthy on labels when things are not. And it completely confuses the public. So that's another reason why we're in this boat. Um, So the question is, what does constitute healthy? And I have done a complete, you know, shall we say, rehash of all of the data that's out there to try to figure out what actually does constitute healthy so that people can understand what it is they need to look for. And what I came to the realization as I did that, and that's one of the reasons I had to write the book, is that all food is healthy. It's what we do to the food that's not. And so what do we do to the food? that makes it unhealthy as we started with, you know, ultimately processed food is poison. And the reason is because it damages the liver 
and starves the gut. And so protect the liver, feed the gut is, you know, what I'm basically saying is the definition of healthy. So the question is protect the liver from what? Mm. Protect the liver from simple sugars, fructose and glucose in particular, um, sucrose, uh, 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 starches, you know, so basically all your carbohydrates. And I actually don't call fructose a carbohydrate because it's actually metabolized more like alcohol. And that's, that's also another Eureka is that fructose and alcohol are metabolized virtually identically and through a completely different mechanism than glucose is. And that's one of the reasons why we have this problem is because the food industry says a sugar is a sugar. And that's not true. That's, you know, completely false. It's blatantly provably false that a sugar is not a sugar and matters a lot as to what that carbohydrate is. And fructose is very egregious in terms of its metabolism. Um, but protect the liver from simple sugars, the tsunami of sugars that hit the liver, that the liver basically becomes overwhelmed, cannot handle all the sugar that's coming at it all at once. And the liver has no choice but to take the excess and turn it into liver fat. And then that liver fat will either be exported out as triglycerides, thereby contributing to obesity and heart disease, or that triglyceride will not end up being exported out. It will precipitate in the liver as a lipid droplet. Now you have fatty liver disease, and now you have the makings of type two diabetes, cirrhosis, and, and uh, cancer, and numerous other chronic um, uh, dementia, chronic diseases, because your liver is now insulin resistant and your pancreas has to make more to make the liver do its job. And that raises those insulin levels we talked about before and drives growth around the body instead of burning. So it's all about that insulin. So it's all about that liver. So you've got to protect the liver from simple carbohydrate. You also have to protect the liver from branch chain amino acids. Now, branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine. These are essential amino acids. You must consume them. Your body can't make them. They are 20% of muscle. You must have them. But what if you eat too much of them? If you're not building muscle, is there a place to store the excess? No. So what happens to it? Those branched amino acids, those excess go to the liver. The liver takes the amino group off. Now you have a branch chain organic acid such as oxaloacetate, that then enters the Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, and the mitochondria. Mitochondria can't handle the load, just like it couldn't with sugar. It throws it off as citrate. The citrate then causes that same liver fat formation. This is the work of Christopher Newgard at Duke University. And so branched chain amino acids contribute to liver fat and insulin resistance the same way sugar does same way alcohol does, same way trans fats do. So once that fat is in the liver, you're in trouble. You now have the makings of chronic disease. And if you don't do anything about it, you will get sick. Yeah, I, I think it's important to pause here because there's this adage that people keep saying, you, you are what you eat. And I just want to remind everyone that what Professor Robert is talking about, he didn't mention the consumption of fat once. He was talking about the consumption of sugars, carbohydrates, and the consumption of proteins. However, it leads to a situation that we in medicine call NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we're going to talk about just now. And it's because the liver has this ability to change the, the essential food group from one type to the other. So you may think you're not consuming fat, but your liver is still storing that fat because you're eating the wrong types and the wrong amounts of food. Now, I remember when you spoke about this, the first time I heard it, and you had these incredible pictures up, which were, I think they were MRIs, um, corona MRIs showing uh, an individual's abdomen, and you had an adult and you had a young person as well. And you were talking about thin, sick people versus fat, sick people. And what yes. really jarred me and, and you know, I, I took a lot of notice was, is here you had, I think it was a 12-year-old or 14-year-old child, and their liver looked like that of a 56-year-old individual, you know, having probably had some sort of alcoholic history. 
Yes. This is incredible. Uh, yeah. And there are lots of parents going to be watching this. Help us understand how does this actually happen? What's the mechanism that leads to this? Right. So why is it that children today get the diseases of aging? Why is it today that children get the diseases of alcohol? So I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. I've been working since 1976. Kids used to be thin. Kids used to be healthy. Now they're fat and unhealthy, but there's something even more fat than their bodies, their livers. So this is a new disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Prior to 1980, if you saw somebody with a fatty liver, they were an alcoholic. But to now, now today, 20% of all children in America, 40% of obese children, now have fatty liver disease, but they don't drink alcohol. So how come kids are getting the diseases of alcohol without alcohol? How come they're getting the diseases of aging without aging? So this was the big you know, conundrum. This was the concern. And I was faced with this question, just like everyone else was, because ultimately that was causing the insulin resistance, that fat in the liver. And so I had to understand where it came from in order to figure out how to get rid of it. And the answer is that sugar, this fructose molecule, this sweet molecule in sugar is metabolized in the liver identically to that of alcohol. And it makes sense that that would be the case because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of sugar. It's called wine. We do it in Napa and Sonoma every day. The big difference between fructose and alcohol is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism called glycolysis. For fructose, we do our own first step. But after that, the way the mitochondria handle the, pro the, uh, the, the intermediates is exactly the same. And so what we have here in both alcoholism and in sugar consumption is mitochondrial overload. That's what chronic disease is. It's mitochondrial dysfunction due to mitochondrial overload. The mitochondria are the little energy burning factories inside each of our cells. They are what turn food into ATP, chemical energy that power the cell. That's their job is to turn food into ATP, but they have a limit. They have a limited capacity. And when you exceed that limit, the cell would die unless it has a pop-off. And it turns out that pop-off is not so good. That pop-off is turning the excess into fat. It's how your liver turns carbohydrate into fat. It's a process called de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. So when you consume sugar, it doesn't stay as sugar. It basically gets turned by your liver into fat. And you can know whether or not that's causing a problem by measuring your serum triglycerides because your serum triglycerides are the export of fat out of the liver. Okay. So when you eat a steak, that's not raising your triglycerides. That's raising your LDL. But when you're eating an ice cream sundae, that's raising your triglycerides in the same way alcohol would raise your triglycerides. Now, problem is your doctor never, doesn't even pay attention to the triglyceride level on your lipid profile. They only look at the LDL. And that's because that's what they've been trained to do because they have statins for that. And because, you know, a lot of people don't come in fasting. So, you know, and, and getting a postprandial triglyceride level is fraught with, with difficulty in terms of interpretation. So doctors have always been basically told, don't bother with the triglyceride level. Just look at the LDL level and then determine whether or not they need a statin. This is hogwash. This is garbage. Yeah. Okay. What you need to know is what is the LDL level and what is the triglyceride level at the same time because that will tell you how the liver is processing energy. And that will determine whether or not the problem is insulin resistance or really this high, a high cholesterol. So, you know, this is what I explain in the book, 
you know, in chapter nine is how to use the information from your lab tests to be able to diagnose yourself and probably tell your doctor what's wrong with you because they sure don't know. So let's recap. What we're saying here is that the consumption of carbohydrates, principally sugars, mainly fructose, which seems to be the, the, the dangerous one, the, the liver's inability to, to deal with that through the insulin, the hyperinsulin uh, levels, leads to a, uh, um, a denoralipogenesis. And because the liver then can't store all of that, obviously fatty liver results, but then it starts to pump that out into the bloodstream. And that raises the, tri the triglyceride level. So it's not that you're eating fat, which is what a lot of us medics think. It's because of the sugar pathway that's then leading to the rise in triglyceride levels that you see in your patient. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And people don't understand that and they don't, you know, they ignore that part. And that part is absolutely essential in terms of being able to fix metabolic health. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about fructose and we know that fructose obviously exists in fruit and it is there in the natural world in some places. But glucose is what a lot of people's awareness is around. It's important for different cells, including the brain. You need glucose. Uh, well, obviously there's ketones which can help in lactic acid, but the main fuel for burning in the brain is glucose. What is the physiological difference between the two? How does the body actually metabolize these two differently? Uh, and what are the effects of having too much glucose as well? Right. So glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Yeah. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. You know, people on the carnivore diet still have a serum glucose level. <laughs> the Inuit, you know, they didn't have a place to grow a carbohydrate. They had ice, they had whale yeah. blubber. Okay, they still had a serum glucose level. So, because glucose is so important, your body will make it even if you don't eat it. So while glucose is essential for life, consuming glucose is not essential for life. And that's another thing the food industry says is you need sugar to live, garbage. You do not need sugar to live. You don't even need carbohydrate to live. You need your body to be able to make carbohydrate to yeah. live. I don't argue that. That doesn't mean you have to eat it. And it certainly doesn't mean you have to eat the food industry's version of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So glucose is essential. Fructose is completely vestigial to all eukaryotic life on this planet. There's no biochemical reaction anywhere in the human or primate, or even right down to, you know, um, the salamander you know, you, any eukaryote um, that requires dietary fructose for life. It is completely vestigial. It is a holdover from our plant ancestors as a storage unit. And it's probably why they're plants and we're not. The bottom line is we like it a lot. Yeah. It's sweet. In fact, it stimulates dopamine release at the level of the reward center, the nucleus accumbens. Okay, it is reward. It is apple pie. It is Fourth of July. It is Valentine's Day. Okay, it is what they spike the food with to get you to buy more. And they know it. And we have the data to show it. Okay, it is a food industry ploy that they have learned in part because we went low fat and low fat food tastes like cardboard. So they had to do something to make the food palatable. They added sugar. So <clears throat> fructose is completely vestigial. You don't need it, but it stimulates the reward system and in the extreme is addictive. Now, people think that's, you know, sort of hyperbole. That's, that's over the top. How can sugar be addictive? Well, how many people you know who say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth? That's sugar addiction. They're just looking for an enabler. Okay. It's still socially acceptable to, to say that. Okay. You know, you know, people coming up to you and say, you know, I have a horrible cocaine problem. You know, that is not socially acceptable. All right. But it's still socially acceptable to say, I have a horrible sweet tooth. That's sugar addiction. Bottom line, 20% of the world is sugar addicted. Okay. In the same way that 20% of the world is alcohol addicted. 
So we have teetotalers never touch the stuff. We have social drinkers can pick it up, put it down, no problem. Okay, but 20% are either binge drinkers or hardcore alcoholics. And the same basically is true for sugar. So we have a lot of sugar in our diet and it's been placed there by the food industry on purpose for its purposes, not for yours. And they know when they add it, you buy more. And I can prove it through an economic principle. This principle is called price elasticity. So price elasticity is an economic term. What it says is, how will consumption change when the price of a product goes up by 1%? Now, normally, if the price goes up, consumption should go down. And the question is, to what degree? So something that is price elastic means that when the price goes up, people stop consuming it. An example of that would be eggs. So eggs are price elastic. Price goes up, consumption goes down. That's elastic. Let's talk about the substances that are price inelastic, where when price goes up, consumption doesn't change. The top three, fast food, soft drinks, juice. What do those three things share in common? Right. So we have the data to show that we are addicted. This is a hedonic substance in the same way that alcohol is a hedonic substance, that nicotine is a hedonic substance, cocaine, heroin, et cetera, are hedonic substances. And in the extreme, they lead to addiction. So I have an entire chapter in the book about basically food addiction, which is really sugar addiction. And it's really not food addiction. It's food additive addiction. Because the two things that are found in food (coughs) that are addictive are sugar and caffeine. And those are both food additives. We call it added sugar. It's a food additive. Okay. So it's not so crazy to understand that. But of course, the food industry wants none of that you know, they're basically, you know, telling you that their food is absolutely inherently good and wholesome and healthy. And the question is, how do you define healthy? And the answer is, well, guess what? Raisin bran used to be healthy and now it's not. It used to say right on the box, heart healthy. And now it doesn't. And why is that? The answer is because they were sued. And they had to take the word healthy off the front of the package because of the added sugar in raisin bran. Not the sugar in the raisins. It was the sugar on the raisins. Okay, Raisins are brown and purple. Okay, The, sh- the uh, raisins in raisin bran are white because they are dunked in a sugar solution, very specifically to increase their sweetness, to get you to buy more. Okay, let us uh, talk about the second part of that phrase. We spoke about protect the liver, we're now gonna talk about feed the gut. And uh, a lot of this comes down to the conversation on the microbiome. Now I remember, uh, I mean, I went to 20 years ago from med school now, I didn't have a single lecture on the microbiome. It was only post-graduation, It started to enter, and now, of course, it's just exploded. So many different tests going on. Uh, Talk to us about what the microbiome is, and particularly why it's just so, so important in health and well-being. Well, we're still learning that. You know, I don't, what I'm going to tell you is not the last word on this. This is the hottest topic in medicine by far and away, is what is the microbiome and why is it telling you what to do? Okay, it has a mind of its own, the mind gut connection, if you will. My colleague, Dr. Emron Meyer at UCLA, you know, is a world's expert in this. Um, so we are 10 trillion cells, but we have 100 trillion bacteria in our intestine. So our bacteria actually outnumber us 10 to 1. Now, they got to eat, they got to survive. So what do they eat? Well, they eat what you eat. The question is, how much did you get versus how much did they get? Now, they need to get what they need. So when they're not getting it, they send out signals 
to tell you to eat other stuff and the lots more of it so that you can feed them. The point is that about 25 to 30% of what you eat is supposed to go to your bacteria to keep them alive. And that's another reason why calories are a stupid measure. And I'm trying to kill the calorie is because calories are measured here at the mouth. What did you ingest? Who cares? What you really want to know is what did you absorb? And and since the microbiome takes 25 to 30% and sometimes even 35%, how are you supposed to measure that? So this whole concept of calories, I think is, you know, a canard. And I say, so, you know, in the book that, you know, my job, my self-appointed job is to kill the calorie as a unit of measure. It never made sense. It actually is, you know, um, it's egregious. It it actually, you know, takes us in the absolute wrong direction. Anyway, these bacteria, they need to eat something. What if you don't supply them with what they need? And by the way, what they need is fiber. So fiber turns out not to be for you. You don't have the enzymes to break it down. They do. The bacteria have the enzymes to break down the fiber. The fiber in your food is the food for your bacteria. But processed food is fiberless food. Fiber has been stripped out. So you are depriving the bacteria of the food they need to basically keep you alive and keep you healthy. And what happens is if you deprive those bacteria of that fiber, they get angry. And they start eating the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells. They denude parts of your intestine in order to stay alive because you didn't feed them. Okay. In the same way that if you don't feed your dog, your dog might start chewing on your shoes and every other part of your, you know, your, your, your house. Okay. And destroy your house. Like my dog is doing right now. (laughs) Truly. Not because I'm not, feeding them by the way. Uh, <laughs> but the point is that though the, those bacteria are actually denuding part of your intestine and allowing the bacteria that are in your intestine immediate approximation and opposition to those intestinal cells, which can cause intestinal inflammation, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and also this phenomenon where the junctions between the intestinal cells open up and become leaky, and we call that leaky gut. And then lipopolysaccharides or cytokines or even full bacteria can make their way from the intestine into the bloodstream. And now you've got systemic inflammation. Now you've got liver inflammation, which then drives liver insulin resistance, which drives hyperinsulinemia, and now you're off to the races. So you have to keep your gut healthy or your gut will basically turn on you. Now, this is the reason why everyone's so interested in this concept of probiotics. So I'm going to challenge you, Dr. Rani. Can you quote me one study anywhere in the world's literature, even one, just one, that shows that taking a probiotic makes a difference in terms of health? I know you're legally trained, so I'm going to say... uh... Uh, that uh, it's a suggested question, Your Honor. <laughs> You're leading the witness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to challenge your entire audience to that. Right. The concept of probiotics makes sense. The problem is, why, if you have, if if a probiotic makes sense, you know, probiotics are living culture. Okay, it's alive. Yeah. You yeah. you swallow it, it should take and grow and populate. And you should only have to take it once. Why do you have to keep taking it? Well, I'm assuming the stomach acid will, will sort of denature or kill off some of those. I mean, that's a pretty SPH no, product, they're, isn't it? No, they're in enteric coated capsules. You're making it into the intestine. The problem is that the intestinal milieu is so inhospitable. It's such a bad environment, which is what killed those bacteria off in the first place. Right. Unless you fix the environment, those probiotic bacteria can't grow for the same reason they couldn't before you started taking the probiotic. So what you need to do is you need to fix the intestinal environment at the same time you're instituting the probiotic. So how do you do that? That's called a prebiotic. Okay. 
you have to give them the food they need to be able to take hold and eat. And that's called fiber. And my colleague, Dr. Peter Turnbaugh here at UCSF showed that you can take anybody with a crappy microbiome and two days of a high fiber diet, and you've basically turned their microbiome completely around and improved their metabolic health in two days. So fiber is the missing link. You have to feed your gut. In addition, fiber will reduce the rate of absorption of those simple carbohydrates from the intestine into the circulation so that your liver doesn't get pelted. So you are both protecting your liver and feeding your gut at the same time. So fiber is sort of the magic potion that turns poison back into food. The problem is it's been taken out of our food by the food industry for its own purposes because of shelf life. Again, it's processed food that is the problem. And it's not because of what's in the food, it's what's been done to the food that makes the difference. Folks, what, what uh, Professor Robert is essentially saying is, is whole foods, and it, it doesn't have to get much more complicated than that. It's whole foods, uh, you know, nutritious, uh, natural foods, which can heal so many of our problems. If I, if I, if I look at the, this idea the disease of diseases, right? You know, in, in med school, we were taught cardiovascular sciences, endocrinology, neurology, Alzheimer's, or you know, neurodegenerative disorders. These were all separate silos. Now we're beginning to see this idea that they're stemming from one central causative element. Now there are different aspects to that. There's glycation, there's oxidative stress, insulin resistance, inflammation, methylation, dysfunction, etc. But it seems that a lot of the answers to this central core is actually not that difficult. It's eating well, it's moving a little bit more every day, it's reducing your stress and sleeping. I mean, it's these little few things that we can make change around. All the things we know. Uh, the, the bottom line is that the diseases that we call diseases, the ones you just rattled off, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia. These are not diseases. These are symptoms of disease. They're symptoms. Okay. And the problem is that when you treat the symptom, the disease is still there. It's like giving an aspirin to a patient with a brain tumor because they have a headache. You might be fixing the headache, but you're not fixing the brain tumor and you're still going to die. So these diseases that we call diseases are really actually symptoms of disease. And so when you treat the high LDL with a statin, are you fixing the problem? No, <clears throat> you're fixing the symptom. When you treat a uh, high blood pressure with an antihypertensive, are you treating the problem? No, you're treating the symptom. When you treat the high glucose with an oral hypoglycemic agent, are you treating the, the symptom or are you treating the problem? You're treating the symptom. Turns out the problem, the disease, true diseases, we have names for them, but doctors don't know them. And the reason doctors don't know them is because there's no ICD-11 code for them, because there's no drug for them. These are the eight subcellular pathologies that belie all chronic disease. I call them in the book, the hateful eight. And they are, as you mentioned, <clears throat> glycation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, membrane instability, inflammation, methylation, and autophagy. No ICD-11 code for those. No medicines for those. So how do you fix those? Food. Those are all foodable, not druggable. And so when we give medicine to patients as doctors, we give medicine to patients, we are actually, in a sense, doing them a disservice because we are papering over the problem instead of dealing with it. And so that's the other reason I wrote the book is to basically teach doctors what their Hippocratic Oath really was about. Yeah. Keeping people healthy, not trying to fix sickness after it's already occurred. So for the young doctors who are watching this, if one were to imagine a metabolic panel, which would be important for their patients to have done, we've already spoken about the importance of fasting insulin and the role that it is in, in sort of picking up early disease on the, on the spectrum of diabetes. 
Uh, in the book, uh, you talk about ALT as well uh, and looking at fancy liver disease and the, and the role of, of ALT. So, so where does that play a part and how do we interpret this? Because I've heard you talk about the range moving over time, which is it's fascinating. Uh, and it, I'm sure our listeners would be very keen to hear that story. So, you know, Dr. Rani, you're relatively young. Okay, you graduated from med school in 2000... 2008. 2008. Okay. All right. I graduated medical school in 1980. I entered in 1976. And when I entered medical school, the upper limit for ALT was 25. Today it's 40. Now, exact same assay, different name, by the way. It used to be called SGPT. Now it's called ALT, but same assay, same measure. Okay. It's a measure of liver fat. It's sensitive, but not specific. Okay. So if you've got liver fat, your ALT goes up, but you know, other things can make your ALT go up aside from liver fat, like Tylenol, et cetera. Okay. But an ALT of 40 is considered normal based on the lab slip. If you read the off the side, you know, and, it goes up to 40, but it used to be 25. So how did it go from 25 to 40? The answer is the entire curve shifted to the right over the last 40 years because 40%, 45%, sorry, of the entire U.S. adult population has fatty liver and they don't know it. So when they go to the doctor and they get their blood drawn, they, the doctor says, well, your ALT is 35, you're fine. Uh, you're not fine. You are definitely not fine. Okay. It's just that your doctor doesn't, doesn't know how to interpret it because they must not have lived as long as me. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you need to understand this. Another example of that is uric acid. So the upper level of uric acid is seven, <clears throat> but uric acid is a marker, not just of um, purine metabolism. It's a marker of sugar metabolism and sugar consumption. And it is um, it, uh, uric acid is the um, endogenous inhibitor of in, uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which is your blood pressure lower. So when your uric acid goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Okay? And everyone's blood pressure is higher than it used to be by at least two to four points. Okay? Some people much more. And for every two point increase in blood pressure, you have a 10% increased risk for stroke. Okay, but do you see that two points, you know, I mean, in, 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 in the blood pressure reading, you know, no. Okay, but could you see that in the uric acid level? You could, because anything over 5.5 is a question mark. But the lab slip says seven. And the reason is because the entire curve has shifted to the right because of our sugar consumption. So understanding these, you know, changes in our global health and what these lab tests actually measure is essential for being able to not just help individuals, but to help populations. And that's the other reason I wrote the book. That last point on uric acid is very important because people, when they see a high uric acid, they immediately think, okay, this, this patient is maybe having a lot more protein, excessive protein uh, in their diet, and they immediately, as well as the prescription of anapurinol, they'll say, okay, now cut back on red meats and all of these things. But you're essentially, what you're showing in the book is that the fructose met uh, metabolism of fructose actually leads through to the rising of uric acid, which can have nothing That's to do with that protein intake at all. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so uric acid is very nonspecific in that respect. So yes, increased protein, uh, protein, purine, really it's nucleic acid consumption, um, will increase your uric acid. That is true, but also increased sugar consumption will also increase it. And the reason is because you deplete your liver of ATP because you have to phosphorylate the fructose molecule that depletes ATP. And when ADP goes to AMP, goes to IMP, goes to uric acid, and then gets excreted. So your uric acid is a proxy for excess sugar consumption as well. Even Ben Franklin knew that. He actually wrote a poem about ode to his gout. Okay. <laughs> he knew that it was the sugar in his diet that was causing it. Okay. So, you know, doctors have no excuse. All right. Sugar drives uric acid. Uric acid drives gout. You want to stop the gout, get rid of the sugar. Everybody knows that. <laughs>
Point is that that uric acid has lots and lots of bad effects. It also affects mitochondrial function because uric acid in, uh, inhibits CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which is the shuttle mechanism for getting fatty acids into the mitochondria to be able to oxidize them and generate ATP from those. So basically, everything that sugar does to mitochondria by inhibiting AMP kinase, by increasing uric acid, by inhibiting ACAD-L, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, which is necessary for fatty acid oxidation inside mitochondria. Everything about this molecule is a poison. And we've been adding it to the food, but only processed food. So this is why it's essential to understand the difference between food and processed food, because food is food, food is medicine, and processed food is not. And until yourself, we understand that, we're not going to fix it. You've set yourself out on a very ambitious goal, and uh, I certainly uh, have full support for this, because it has the opportunity to s s save and change so many lives. Where do you see this movement, this advocacy uh, in three to five years from now? What are you most optimistic about changing? Well, look, the bottom line is we need a cultural tectonic shift around food. Now, it can happen. We've already seen four, count them, four cultural tectonic shifts in the last 30 years around the world. And here they are, bicycle helmets and seatbelts, smoking in public places, condoms in bathrooms, drunk driving. 30 years ago, if a legislator stood up in a state house and proposed legislation against any of those four things, they'd have gotten laughed right out of town. Today, they're all facts of life. No one's arguing about any of them. How come? And why did it take 30 years? We taught the children. The children grew up. They voted. And the naysayers are dead. That's why it's a cultural tectonic shift. And that's why it takes a generation. You don't actually change people's minds. What you do is you influence new minds entering the argument. That's how you fix a problem. And that's why it took so long for tobacco. That's why it took so long for drunk driving, et cetera. Okay. But it worked. It happens. My goal is for you five years from now to walk down the street, see somebody drinking a Coca-Cola, and feel sorry for them. And when that day happens, then the food system will change. It's on its way, but it's going to take a little while. Well, I, I really wish you well. Uh, we fully support the work that you are doing with this very important initiative. And thank you for advocating and taking charge and creating research-based content, which is so important for people to appreciate and understand. I appreciate your saying that. This is all based in science, you know, science is my sword and it's my shield. Okay. I will never say anything that the science doesn't allow. So, you know, people have to understand, trust the science. Professor Robert Lustig, thank you very much for being with us on the edge. Thanks for having me, Dr. Annie. It's been my pleasure.